So in terms of um, our sort of recommendation, um, the two main options um, we typically see used are the incorporated trust with charitable status and the incorporated society with charitable status. So obviously that's circumstance dependent. Um, it will really will depend on the aims of the people setting up the organisation or, or checking its purpose. Um, and but those are the two types that we typically see most often. So the main reasons for that are people like the idea of the separate legal entity and the limited liability, first off. Um, obviously that comes with the responsibility of complying with duties um, in each case and getting to understand those duties that apply. Um, but in most cases, people do like that separate um, entity structure and limited liability. Um, succession is often something that's considered. Um, so having a separate legal entity allows for people to come through as trustees or um, as committee members without um, any sort of upsetting the uh, association that would otherwise be the case. Um, the democratic process versus tight control. So um, obviously the trust with, with a tighter level of control and incorporated society for the statutory democratic process. Um, so having one option for each is helpful as well. Charitable status, um, obviously that tax exemption is the, is the main draw card there. So that's typically what we see for catchment groups um, or irrigation schemes heading down those sorts of, of tracks for those sorts of reasons. Okay, so the new incorporated societies bill. Um, so it is due to become law any day. It's waiting its third reading. Um, so those with incorporated societies already set up, um, this is, is going to be relevant to you. If you're setting up a new incorporated society um, after it becomes um, enacted, then you would just slot into the new rules. So effectively, the main takeaway for this section is if you have an existing incorporated society, you're going to need to review your constitution or rules and update them to meet the new requirements. And that all needs to be done by the 1st of December, 2025. So if, if you don't do that, um, then you'd be removed from the register and effectively cease to exist. So there is an ability to, to get put back onto the register after that date, but it becomes an application and discretionary process um, with, with the registrar. So you, you really don't want to go down that track. Um, so if you have an existing incorporated society, obtaining advice around what you need to do to update your constitutional rules um, will become quite important. Um, once that law gets passed, there'll be more and more information floating around about the specifics. Um, but there are a number of changes um, across the board. So things like um, boards becoming subject to specific statutory duties, similar to a director of a company. Um, and they're set out in full. Um, membership changes, so rights of members to obtain information. So there's, there's more uh, rights there given to, to members. Um, more rights given around the AGM and SGM type processes. Um, there's more financial reporting and compliance requirements um, being, being flowed through. Um, and there's also a, a few, I guess, missing parts of the 1908 Act, which are being added in. Uh, again, like a company, um, amalgamation, wind-up processes, they're all being clarified in the new legislation as well. So the key takeaway is that your constitutional rules will need updating to match these new requirements. Um, in some cases, um, those changes won't be huge and it might just be a, um, a small amendment or adding in additional pieces to those constitution and rules. Where it takes the time is the board often takes the role in creating those amendments and taking advice and doing what they need to do to update the constitutional rules. Um, but obviously members in an incorporated society will then need to be consulted um, and then vote to um, adopt those new changes or a new constitution. So it's that process that can take time. Um, members often need to be educated as to what's changing um, 
and and why it's happening and and what the effect of the changes are. And then an SGM is often called, so a special general meeting. Um, so not normally done within the AGM process, but a special meeting is called uh, and a vote's taken. Usually that vote requires 75% or more of members to approve the change um, for it to be given effect to. So member consultation before the SGM becomes quite important. But if you've got a board that's meeting monthly or bi-monthly, um, then that process um, of finalising the changes and getting to an SGM can take some time. So that's why there's a quite a lead in time, sort of three-ish years, um, but it, it does take often six to 12 months to, to work through that process, depending on how broad your membership is. So um, what we'd suggest there is you reach out to your um, solicitor that's looking after your incorporated society and take some advice around um, the process, what needs to change, and um, just getting a bit of help often around the drafting of that constitution or a modernised set of rules. So yeah, in summary, that's, that's it. I wanted to say a big thank you to Barbara and Chris for joining us today and sharing all of their knowledge and expertise with catchment groups um, and coordinators from all around the country. So it's been really valuable. So thank you very much for that. Um,